Hello and welcome to Newswire. I'm Aiza Umar. Now, Pakistan-sponsored U.S. Taliban talks have started Monday in Abu Dhabi to find a peaceful way out of this 17-year war in Afghanistan. Representatives from the Taliban, senior government officials from Pakistan, Saudi Arabia and UAE attended these talks, but the Afghan government officials remain absent. This is the third round of talks taking place between the U.S. and the Taliban this year. What does this mean for the region? How close is Afghanistan in finding peace? We will be talking to our guests. I'd like to welcome General uh, Amjad Shoaib here, a defense analyst based out of Islamabad. Let's ask you this. Uh, how do you see these peace talks unfolding in Abu Dhabi? Uh, first of all, all of us, we should welcome, after all, it's a step towards attaining stability, peace in the region. But the success perhaps is still far away. And that again will depend on the sincerity of the sides who are participating, particularly the United States. The United States is controlling the Kabul government. And I don't think Kabul government independently can, it can take such a scene. Uh, <clears throat> which are crucial. Similarly, Taliban have certain demands, and uh, I don't know to what extent these demands, these preconditions are accepted by the other side. They want their travel bans to be lifted. They want certain people to be released who have been arrested by the U.S. And so certainly there are some <clears throat> other small uh, demands from them, and these are the prerequisites. At the same time, uh, my, personally, when I look at it, I get a feeling that uh, this is a move which perhaps is to deceive the other side or uh, it's a sort of deception which is being created. Because Pakistan has been facilitating uh, these talks earlier also, and these are sabotaged by, either by the Northern Alliance or by U.S. Uh, we remember that we had started off with muddy process. 2016. The brought, they were brought on the table. And uh, China was participating, even U.S. participated. But suddenly the issue of Mulama's death was raised by Afghanistan, by the Northern Alliance from there, and the uh, talks were stalled. Thereafter, Mullah Mansur Akhtar was running around to restart the talks when he was killed by the U.S. Uh, while he was entering from Iran to Pakistan. Now, thereafter, they never ever indicated any special interest in resuming the talks. Occasionally, they would talk about it. Mm -hmm. But suddenly now, they have become very active. And personally, I have a feeling that this uh, uh, sort of uh, agency on the part of U.S. perhaps is related to what all is going on, in, what all has been going on in Moscow, they perhaps want to stall the Moscow process because uh, they cannot afford to hand over the initiative to the Russians while they are still sitting in Afghanistan. So from that point of view, to regain that in initiative of uh, involving the Taliban in talks, etc., <coughs> they have been pressurizing Pakistan to arrange this thing. <coughs> Otherwise, they never needed any help from Pakistan because they have been talking to the Taliban uh, at will. They have been going to Qatar whenever they wanted to. Uh, at well held a meeting, and thereafter, two meetings were held by Zalna Khalilzad also. And where was Pakistan? I think it's a move to pull out Pakistan from the Moscow uh, process because they could not uh, pressurize Russia. They were not in a position to pressurize Iran, but they would try to lure in some of the Central Asian states, the Zal Mekhalizad very recently paid a visit, and they would also pressurize Pakistan to uh, get out of the Moscow process and come on to the table and join hands with the US, US. So from if, if this is true, the, the, the whole thing that I'm perceiving, then I don't think the US will be too serious in uh, uh, concluding the talks to a successful end. They would definitely like to pull out their troops, but they would like to retain their bases there they have eight bases, and they have a very big base uh, at Bagram. These are the permanent installations. And if I related to the American National Security Strategy paper in which they had categorically said that their future adversaries are, uh, competitors are Russia and China. China, from economy point of view, they want to contain China so that China doesn't become 
the number one economy of the world, and U.S. is relegated to the second position. Similarly, <clears throat> there is a, a competition with Russia in uh, in the field of weaponry. Russians are uh, progressing very rapidly, and they have uh, been able to manufacture some of the very lethal weapons. So, are and you that saying why... that? Are you saying that after the Moscow talks took place in trying to bring the Taliban to the negotiating table, U.S. changed its stance because that's when the Trump administration, which had been saying that Pakistan has playing a double game, has been taking billions and not returning anything, had suddenly changed their stance and written to Prime Minister yes. Imran Khan. Yes, and also, also one should link it to the uh, South Asian strategy paper which uh, the American government issued or the Pentagon had issued, in which they had said that uh, India will play the main role in the region and also in Afghanistan. Now, but, mm -hmm. will it be acceptable to Pakistan that India will continue to doing whatever they are doing already against Pakistan from there right under the north of the U.S.? And once the superpowers, they issue their strategy papers or they issue their policy papers, it is not um, a, a, a CA child's play that you change it the next day or change it within 15 days or a month. It's not Modern taken lightly, is what you're saying. To do that. This, these papers are workable at least for the tenure of uh, uh, Donald Trump and maybe right. even beyond. Right so now, there's also way, they might have changed their strategy, but they do not. Uh, their objectives remain to be the same. But that's interesting because the U.S. military chief, General Joseph Dunford, he's he's gone and expressed apprehension in withdrawing the U.S. forces from Afghanistan, while the Trump administration pushes that we need to uh, withdraw, stating that this will just create instability in the region South Asia and it also gives space to terrorists to attack America again. Do you see the statements uh, maybe as a contradiction to what President Trump has been saying so far? No, it, uh, I mean, throughout, I think I've been seeing this thing that right from the beginning when Trump was, uh, was, was campaigning for his uh, presidency. At that time, he said it's a futile war and I'm going to pull out all the troops and we are going to burden that. What are we getting from there? Mm -hmm. And ultimately, it was the Pentagon which prevailed, the State Department. And they, he not only that he couldn't pull out those troops, he had to reinforce by another 3,000 people. So that way, I think whatever uh, the chairman, uh, John C. staff had said, Trump will have to go by that. And that is the actual policy. And that has a, rel a relationship to what they have been saying in their national strategy paper also, national security strategy paper. So ultimately, I think they are going to stick to the place. Particularly, they, I think they'll be very firm about their basis. And this opportunity of staying in Afghanistan, once they leave it, they vacate, they will not be able to come back. So they, I think they are going to stick. And it provides them an opportunity to sit around watching, having a very close watch on Iranians and do whatever they feel like against Iran. And similarly, whatever they want to do against Russia. So the where problem does... of Ukraine is still going on, and they, right. if they vacate these areas, it will become uh, difficult for them to interfere in the Central Asian states. And the Taliban's number one demand has been that the U.S. forces all foreign troops withdraw from Afghanistan. That is the reason they have come to the negotiating table. They don't even want to speak to initially, the Western. Initially, Taliban had a, had their bases in Pakistan, in our North Afghanistan. And at that time, they had not opened up their uh, contacts with Russia and Iran, and they, uh, they, to some extent, they were isolated. But then when we pushed them out of our territory, now they have uh, frequent visits to Moscow, they frequently visit Iran, and they are getting a lot of help from there. They are getting weapons, they are getting uh, money, financial support, and definitely Iran and uh, and Russia also have a lot of influence on the Taliban. Now, as far as Russia is concerned and Iran is concerned, they know that while America is here, they will always remain under threat of some kind of subversion or some kind of problems from the American side. So Russians and Iranians will never want that the, that the Americans should continue staying there indefinitely. So once this is their, this is their feeling, the Taliban will not be able to deviate from that, and Russia and Iran are going to force the Taliban to stick to their original demand, original demand of pushing the Americans out of uh, Afghanistan, and they will not perhaps compromise on that. Then it seems uh, to it seems to show that Pakistan plays an even more uh, plays a more crucial role in these peace talks right now for Pakistan, the U.S. at least. Pakistan should declare 
that they will be supporting any process which can bring peace and stability. And that's what the Prime Minister has been saying time and again. Made he said by it yesterday. Russia, made be by America. We will support any initiative which can bring stability and peace to this region because we are generally interested in peace. And we cannot just restrict ourselves to the American efforts. We will support the Russian efforts also. We will support the Chinese efforts. And right. whosoever succeeds will be too happy and we will welcome. But it really puts uh, U.S. in a position, in an awkward position, because they, don't, they continue to stick to their narrative and uh, cutting aid to Pakistan, not paying up on the coalition support fund. I mean, they don't seem, they seem to need us more and more in these peace talks, yet they don't seem see, to be delivering. See, the point is, that is what I was trying to point out, that they have a long-term strategy for the area, where they want India to play the main role. And there are certain demands from India also. They say that if you want us to stand up against China, then at least take off Pakistan, take Pakistan off our back. Because if we are, if if we remain involved with Pakistan, so we will not be able to take care of China. Okay. So Pakistan, as long as it's a nuclear power, India will never be satisfied, and they will remain threatened. So from that point of view, Americans go. That they will, uh, uh, they would like Pakistan to roll back their, uh, um, their nuclear program. They would also want that Pakistan should never be able to enter into a nuclear supplier group. They have already taken you to FATF. Okay. I mean, all sorts of anti-Pakistan moves have already been launched. IMF is in trouble. They 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 are offering very strict um, conditions along with the bill of package. Let me, let me, uh, I'm sorry, General Amjad, I'll ask you to hold that thought. Let me, in our second guest here, Rupert Stern is joining us here from Berlin. He's a political analyst. Uh, welcome to Newswire, Rupert. We're talking about what Pakistan's role has been in light of uh, U.S. Uh, Trump administration's change in stance uh, towards Pakistan in participating in uh, bringing uh, Taliban to the table in terms of what Pakistan's influence is, what is your take on uh, whether there is a, another meaning behind that they need to uh, pressurize the Taliban to come to the peace, uh, peace negotiating table? Well, I think this is Pakistan's relationship with the Taliban is, is often misunderstood um, in Western analysis, um, primarily because it's assumed the relationship is, is much closer and warmer than it in fact is. And following from that, that Pakistan has more control over the Taliban um, than it in fact does. Um, and in fact, I mean, when you look at the literature, um, it's clear that there's a lot of animosity, um, both from the Taliban towards Pakistan, Pakistan to the Taliban, um, which uh, relates to various factors. Um, and that in recent years, the relationship, um, which was always tense, um, has, if anything, become more tense. Um, and the Taliban's tried to reduce Pakistan's control over uh, um, specifically their um, role in negotiations. Um, and so let me rephrase is, my question. What I'm yeah. trying to understand here is, why does the U.S. need Pakistan to participate in these peace talks? Is it just pressurizing the Taliban? This seems to be, by many experts, an old narrative, a redundant narrative, or as our other guest, General Amjad, pointed out, that it is really what the regional players need to... The regional players are maybe realigning themselves in the region? Their alliances? Um, I mean, I think it's certainly an, a redundant narrative because it, um, because it exaggerates Pakistan's control um, over the Taliban. Um, and there are multiple other countries now which have diplomatic relations, relations with the Taliban, um, uh, including Iran and Russia, which used to be uh, staunch adversaries of the group. Um, so to focus solely on Pakistan, I think, is a mistake. To the credit of the United States, they're gradually moving away from a Pakistan-heavy focus. I mean, the South Asia strategy Trump promulgated um, last year um, was focused primarily on Pakistan and India, um, as well as Afghanistan, obviously. Um, and now they've broadened out a bit to include uh, the Central Asian nations, Russia, the Gulf states, etc. So they're gradually coming towards a more regional, multilateral approach. Um, it's, uh, as Winston Churchill said about the U.S., that 
um, they eventually do the right thing, having exhausted all other options. Is this that situation where they've exhausted all other options, or have they finally understood that military solution is not the solution here? Um, well, I think you've got a point that I don't think they're, they, they've come to the, the most pro productive um, approach yet. Um, there's the, the real crux of the negotiations appears to be over the foreign troop presence in Afghanistan um, and whether the United States will, will accede to Taliban demands that they um, at the very least give a, a, troop, a schedule for troop withdrawal prior to any peace process beginning. Um, and that seems to be the main impediment to progress at the moment. Um, so we'll just have to see what happens. But certainly analysts on the issue aren't optimistic. Okay, General Abdul, let me ask you this. The roadmap that the Taliban foresee after if the foreign troops withdraw, does that in any way cross paths with President Ghani's roadmap for peace in Afghanistan? I think President Ghani perhaps generally may be wanting to uh, bring some peace to the country. And being a Pashtun, he would like to mend his fences with the Taliban. But that may not be true in the case of uh, Abdullah Abdullah and Northernized people. And also the Afghan intelligence. We must realize that the Afghan intelligence, Afghan army, and most of the uh, police and other bureaucrats in Afghanistan have been trained by India. And they have a staff and they get a cue from the, from the Indian side. And India and Northern Ireland, they know that they have been fighting a prolonged war against the Taliban. Mm -hmm. And the Taliban, against the Taliban, uh, they have been supporting the Northern Ireland, providing investments and money. And they also know that once the Taliban, they become part of the government, and they have a lion's share in the government, for example, then India and Northern Ireland are going to lose their influence in Afghanistan, in the, in the, in the whole setup which may not be acceptable to them. So they have been playing the role of a spoiler. See, the good, the good and bad Taliban term was coined by India. And they started saying that the Afghan Taliban for Pakistan are good Taliban, and they are not uh, taking them on. So such like things, this was the perhaps purpose for them, to make sure that the Taliban should never be able to uh, become part of the peace process. Right. They always mocked that force should be used against Taliban and somehow they should be finished. Or they should at least be destroyed to, to an extent where they cannot hold a serious threat to the uh, present threat in Afghanistan. So they have been following that approach and they still like to follow, follow that approach. But somehow that approach is not working. That is why the United States now has started thinking of something else and they are coming on to the other uh, process. Even the United States, I think they, every time any, anybody visiting Afghanistan and Pakistan, he would go back and read the Indians in India and Delhi. So they have been getting guidelines from there also. But perhaps they have been compelled because of the current situation that Russia has taken as the initiative. And Americans could not afford to leave it like that because their whole intention would have been exposed by the Russian. And they were told that, look, Taliban are prepared to... Uh, negotiate and go for the uh, some 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 sort of agreement to have peace in Afghanistan, and it, these are the Americans who are spoiling the whole show, or the let's say the Indians. So that is why they are now out to uh, pull out Pakistan from there, so that the Moscow process cannot proceed further. Right, and Rupert, when we talk about U.S. withdrawal, uh, U.S. foreign uh, U.S. and foreign forces withdrawing uh, their positions in Afghanistan. Now, if Taliban holds up its end of the bargain, and this has just come after uh, the peace talks yesterday in uh, Abu Dhabi, that the, the, that their, uh, the U.S. delegation is pressing for a six-month ceasefire as well as an agreement to name uh, Taliban representatives as a future caretaker government. Do you feel like Taliban is the only one that is expected to hold its side of the bargain? Or are there other groups there that might upset uh, the system they're trying to bring into place? Well, um, I mean, it's not necessarily, it's not strictly speaking an independent group, but the, the faction that's often held up as the greatest obstacle to progress is the Haqqani network, um, as I'm sure you and your um, um, viewers know. Um, and that has um, for, for a while been independent of the Taliban, and more recently it was folded into the movement, and now the deputy emir is um, Sirajuddin Haqqani. So they're very 
powerful in the Taliban and um, I think a, a promising aspect of these uh, recent talks in Abu Dhabi is that the delegation included um, a representative of the Haqqani network um, and members of the military committee and that shows that the movement's actually coalescing around a negotiated settlement. Um, in the past, people, analysts had, um, since Mullah Omar's death was revealed in 2015, analysts felt the Taliban as a movement was disintegrating and that coming to any kind of cohesive negotiating strategy would be impossible. Um, and that line was first undermined by the successful implementation of the Eid ceasefire um, earlier this year. And now this um, this negotiation process seems to um, demonstrate that the Taliban is more unified than people previously thought. Um, so that's uh, a promising sign. But being unified and as statistics are showing that they have over 70 percent of Afghanistan in their control, uh, there's also a question of other groups, and I'm referring to here the Islamic State's Khorasan faction uh -huh. here, there in Afghanistan playing such a major role. Uh, they're attacking civilians in urban centers. Will that, in this proposed ceasefire, do you think they will be able to curb that, bring it down, or bring any control over this? Well, I find it very hard to believe the Islamic State would observe a ceasefire. They didn't observe the ceasefire earlier this year. Um, but, uh, I mean, I think if if the various parties to the conflict, I mean, specifically the Taliban, Afghan government and, and foreign forces can come to some kind of agreement, then that would make it easier to neutralize the Islamic State in the long term. But uh, to your question, would they observe a ceasefire? I find that very hard to believe. And there are also, again, statements, this is just from December 4th by Lieutenant General Kenneth McKenzie, who basically, before the Senate Armed Services Committee, said that um, it's uh, the casualty rate of the Afghan security forces continues to rise. This is not a very good time to be negotiating a troop withdrawal uh, of foreign forces because they are really not in a position to defend themselves. Yeah, that's a very good and important point. Um, I mean, this is, I think, um, underappreciated in uh, certainly in Western media is the weakness of the Afghan security forces um, and their hemorrhaging um, soldiers are now at a rate greater than they can recruit them, I think. Um, so this is just unsustainable in the long term. And as you say, it's just inconceivable that uh, they would be able to um, provide for their own security um, unless things change, um, which means that uh, they'll need help and perhaps the foreign forces would need to stay. It has been um, suggested in some reports that the Taliban might be open to a residual foreign troop presence more in a training and advisory role than a combat role um, and of course to continuing foreign aid. And I think the Taliban over time have become more pragmatic um, and they've realized that um, if they are to govern Afghanistan again, they can't be so isolated and they'll need foreign assistance aid to um, keep the, uh, the country afloat. Um, so I don't think that's all bleak on that front. I think there's a possibility of some kind of compromise. Experts are saying this is a moment where Taliban can really cash in on the golden opportunity they have. Uh, is that how you see it? I think it's not just the Taliban. I mean, the, taking the Taliban first, I think they've... Um, they're now so powerful militarily um, and they control so much of the country um, that they feel um, that their um, position is perhaps as strong as it will ever be, um, uh, assuming that the United States continues to commit forces and, and funds to the war um, and that now's the best time to come to the negotiating table and therefore get the best terms they possibly can. But I think it's also a golden opportunity for the international community. Um, I mean, you have a U.S. president who clearly doesn't want to doesn't want to continue this war um, and doesn't want it to muddle on, um, and and is is giving very serious um, impetus to a diplomatic path. And then you have all these other countries neighboring Afghanistan who for. Um, economic reasons um, want Afghanistan to be stabilized so they can use it for trade. I mean, China is the most prominent example 
Um, they want to use Afghanistan for their Belt and Road Initiative. Um, Iran um, has strong interests in Afghanistan, and there are many others. Um, and then there are security issues relating to Islamic State, which m makes these countries concerned about Afghanistan security. So for all these countries, there's um, a lot to be gained from a peaceful Afghanistan, um, uh, not just the Taliban. And, and like you said, the numbers... Uh, and in some estimates are over 60,000 Taliban fighters in Afghanistan. They seem to have a larger bargaining chip in the sense they have more time on their side to negotiate a deal, no matter how long it takes. And on the other hand, the U.S. administration seems to be in a rush. Yeah, I mean, the, the Taliban uh, has suffered in, uh, severe casualties, but they seem to um, compensate with recruits, which can't be said. Um, can't, the same can't be said for the Afghan military, I mean, as I said earlier. Um, and the reports, uh, for instance, there was a report by the United Institute of Peace by Borhan Osman, um, where he interviewed Taliban foot soldiers, and the clear consensus that emerged is that they were prepared to continue fighting, um, and they felt that uh, the best approach was to drive foreign forces out militarily. Um, so there doesn't uh, you seem to be, I think you're right, that the morale is um, is standing up and um, uh, their numbers um, are quite uh, solid. Okay, stay with us, Rupert. We'll be right back after this short break. Welcome back. You're watching Newsfire, and I would like to welcome our third guest. Uh, this is Major General Mohammed Mansha, retired from uh, Islam, about speaking to us as a defense analyst. We're talking about the high casualty rate of the Afghan security forces and how sustainable is it for the U.S. troops to withdraw? And will this bring stability in the region? We have been talking about the withdrawal of uh, the American forces, and there is some engagement with the, the Taliban now which is a very, very positive development. But uh, we are not sure whether they are going to withdraw, they are going to keep part of the forces in the region because they have their long-term interest. But the positive development is that now they have started engaging with the Taliban. They do understand that the minority government cannot bring peace in the region. And the peace in Afghanistan is central to the development and the overall peace of not only this particular region, but the entire, that is, subcontinent, Central Asia, Western Asia, and the Middle East. Therefore, the peace in Afghanistan is the key to the peace around the globe and the future development. And in that sense, this is a positive development that they have engaged they have also sought some cooperation from Pakistan, and Pakistan has been always very keen to promote peace in Afghanistan because peace in Afghanistan is, again, very central to the peace in Pakistan, the economy in Pakistan, right. the overall law and order situation in Pakistan. But General Mansha, I'm sorry to cut you here, but if I ask you, this rhetoric that the U.S. administration continues to have, that Pakistan has influence over the Taliban, something that Pakistan's DGISPRs continuously, along with many other senior leadership members of Pakistan, have said that that is not true. For It's been a long time since that doesn't uh, hold true. Do you feel that maybe this U.S. rhetoric is in a way, a, a, an indirect way of trying to realign alliances, maybe bring forth Pakistan uh, against other regional powers who play a role in Afghanistan? I am sure what you have pointed out that is not true. The influence of Pakistan over the Taliban is similar as if you go back in the past history, Pakistan one time connected China, but with USA, but they would have their own interests, they would have their own uh, dealing. So is uh, the Taliban. They have some common interests with Pakistan because they understand that Pakistan desires a peace in Afghanistan and uh, whereas the other uh, countries, they do promote some forces which are uh, not majority forces and uh, the solo uh, government with the minority would not work. And that is the commonality of interest. I would not say that they have some any unqualified uh, influence over the Taliban, but there is some commonality of interest, some commonality of uh, promoting peace 
And to that sense, yes, Pakistan can persuade them. They already have uh, made some efforts. They have been able to bring both the sides on the table. But certainly Pakistan does not yield that kind of influence that they can dictate something to the Taliban. They have their own interests. And somehow the intellectuals and the diplomats, they always undermine such like uh, the Taliban and those uh, the uh, freedom fighters. They think perhaps they do not have the diplomatic understanding, but they are always very, very crude up. They are uh, expert. They know how to wash their interests. And I'm sure they would watch their interests. They would not go by the dictation by anyone, be it Pakistan, be it United States or anybody else. What? But they will go along with Pakistan as long as there is a convergence of interests. And I want to I want to come back to you uh, with this question. But first, let me ask you, uh, Rupert, you want to compare uh, the roles uh, or the importance whether Pakistan has uh, in the re in in participating in these peace talks and it has again delivered and has arranged these peace talks this is the second time, as compared to trying to bring the Taliban. Uh, in the same room with the Afghan government in trying to promote an intra-Afghan dialogue. Which do you think holds more precedence right now? Um, towards the Afghan government is, uh, is vitriolic, to say the least. Um, I mean, they see them as an illegitimate government installed um, really at gunpoint by the United States. Um, a puppet is what they always call them. Um, uh, and that rhetoric hasn't uh, relented recently um, so I don't really know how um, it's going to work. I mean, if there is a silver lining, it's that there actually has been a fair bit of informal behind the scenes um, negotiation between uh, Afghan officials and the Taliban um, uh, through the years. Um, it would be a gross overstatement to say there's been no contact at all. I mean, only earlier this year um, in Saudi Arabia, Afghan officials and Taliban um, held secret talks, it was reported. Um, so I think that is a sign that uh, maybe there could be negotiations in the future, and certainly the Afghan government is clearly more prepared to engage with the Taliban than it has been uh, ever before. But um, it doesn't seem United that States. the Afghan government was the one who had a, pr had a problem. <clears throat> they had a 12-member committee ready uh, when talks in Moscow were taking place, but the Taliban refused to meet them. Negotiators even now were present in UAE. Do you think there's any possibility that this would be, uh, there would be a behind-the-scenes talks with the Taliban and the, the negotiator from the Afghan government with the help of the US? Well, the Taliban do seem prepared to advance at some point to an intra-Afghan dialogue. Um, what they want to do first, though, is talk to the U.S. and um, secure an a agreement for troop withdrawal. I mean, that's their ultimate precondition. Um, uh, so if, they, if the negotiators can um, cross that hurdle, then maybe some kind of dialogue with Kabul um, could materialize later on. And U.S. is pressing for uh, a ceasefire to hold. Uh, as these peace talks uh, go ahead, and also maybe trying to negotiate a Taliban representative for a future caretaking uh, for the future caretaker uh, government. Do you think this is something the Afghan government, uh, government or Kabul is open to? Well, I think they'll have to be open to a power sharing agreement at the very least um, with the Taliban. Um, uh, whether that means the Taliban actually run some kind of caretaker government's a different matter. I mean, that, that, that could happen if, for instance, the Afghan presidential election, which is scheduled, I think, for April, if that's delayed, which many people uh, believe it could be, then there could be an agreement to have some kind of interim government um, to take charge while these talks are going on. Um, but that wouldn't be led by the Taliban. So... And General Mancha, let me, let me ask you this. We're talking about um, the upcoming elections also. There's so much controversy on the, uh, the parliamentary polls that took place. Uh, there were international observer, observers who said these were not valid. The Taliban have declared them invalid completely. So how does one see a solution when it comes to bringing the Afghan government to agree or the Taliban to agree with an intra-Afghan dialogue? Uh as we mentioned, the, the Taliban certainly have a lot many doubts about the intentions of the Afghan government. And uh, more so, as I mentioned earlier, they thought they are uh, 
not the actual people who are the decision makers they are uh, being dictated by somebody from the outside therefore uh, their uh, contention is they must be talking to those who actually those actors who matter and uh, they think they are uh, the afghan government does not have uh, their own that is uh, original and uh, the, that is domestic agenda they are being dictated but uh, eventually what we were discussing is the there has been uh, some ice breaker then there has been some engagement between the us and the taliban eventually i am sure they will some day would be sitting face to face with the afghan government as well and uh, if the uh, us is sincere to promote peace in the region i am sure there is going to be some positive outcome okay no but that's oh. the question still remains unanswered because the kabul government in itself is so badly divided i mean uh, there are two factions the national unity government and uh, the in the in the national unity government since 2014 how does how does one go about in uh, forming any kind of dialogue when the government itself is so uh, uh, broken uh, i appreciate that is the government itself is divided but uh, the as uh, in my opinion this may not be true it's just uh, one opinion the government uh, on both the factions united states yields uh, that is the uh, influence and they can always bring them closer if they have the genuine interest to promote peace they can always it might be actually something which might be fake just to uh, keep uh, two factions that is one is uh, which is uh, okay. uh, interested to engage and and the other is just okay. to keep their uh, face heavy Okay thank you general uh, mancha thank you let me ask you this we uh, here i'd like to welcome uh, a journalist from kabul mr yasini thank you for joining news wire now as we from kabul how do you see the sentiment uh, amongst the people is there any change any positivity any hopes towards the peace dialogues that are taking place in uae well thank you very much for having me me uh, on your show Uh, I would like to say that the people of Afghanistan are thirsty uh, for the peace talks and uh, for the result, intangible result of the peace talks that which could lead uh, this country to the security and beyond. It is uh, it is border to to the to the neighbors. Uh, the security uh, must come. Uh, people are fed up with the current or uh, the status quo, which is going on, the fighting. Uh, economic uh, uh, problems that we are facing uh, inevitably we have to have the uh, the peace uh, sooner uh, hopefully but even if it is later we have to come uh, around one table and sit uh, with the taliban and reconcile and uh, uh, and in 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 peace uh, this is 17 years this phase of the war is only 6, 17 years old I mean, if you take it from 1978, uh, that's come to uh, almost 40 years or, or over 40 years. So uh, it is, is unbearable, and is, uh, uh, not uh, uh, we are not able to tolerate it anymore. So we are thirsty, we are eager. The sooner the better to have the peace. And also, Mr. Yasin, if you talk a little more about the public sentiment, the U.S. administration has. Uh, until last year their stance was very aggressive towards fighting the taliban and now they've changed tactics is this in a way them endorsing the taliban as a recognizable entity in afghanistan well if it is not a recognizable uh, entity in, in afghanistan why do you should go and have a special and why for the peace talks and uh, uh, why uh, president donald trump would write a letter with uh, to to uh the prime minister of pakistan mr imran khan so uh, it did does show the 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 full uh, uh, uh defective recognition to be uh, uh, to, to the age of the de jure recognition of a uh, uh, taliban presence of their moment at least uh and in the in uh, the people realize that the people knows that whether the understood it later or sooner uh but now this is the reality this uh if you do not reconcile if you do not uh, uh, indulge in a critical and meaningful peace talks with the with the taliban 
we will have to bear further miseries in Afghanistan and uh, will go beyond the border and that will be that will jeopardize the, the security of the neighboring and immediate neighboring country uh, at, at the first into the regional countries in the second degree and into the whole international security. It is a threat uh, insecurity of Afghanistan to the whole world. Do you think that the Taliban are maybe now showing some flexibility in their demands, especially when they have well, categorically said that the only the only party they'll speak to is the U.S. Uh, is is with the U.S. and have nothing to do with the Kabul government? Well, the thing is that uh, everybody should understand, including the Taliban, that the military uh, solution for this conflict is uh, uh, incredibly impossible. Uh, so uh, we have to be uh, around the, 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 the negotiation table. And we don't want to spoil this opportunity. Uh, in the whole Afghan nation, as I mean, uh, including Taliban, including government, including other political entities, uh, and, 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 and to, 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 uh, to, to make the, the, the real result uh, of this conflict uh, is uh, not high, it is very clear and obvious that is in the reconciliation the meaningful and practical task. And so when the Taliban asked for U.S. withdrawal of forces from there, I mean, on the other hand, uh, we see Lieutenant General Kenneth McKenzie saying that uh, if they do withdraw, it will really uh, be a problem for the Afghan security forces, which are fighting hard, but their losses are not going to be sustainable. Uh, the, how do you see this being a problem? Do you feel like Taliban will hold their end of the bargain in uh, maintaining peace? Well, uh, but, but speaking practically, as a people representative uh, in Afghanistan and born in this uh, unfortunate era of 40 years and grown up, uh, if we do insist on the withdrawal of the U.S. forces from Afghanistan, it will create immediately a big mess. Uh, no uh, independent... Uh, uh, individuals uh, a free uh, person would like to have the other forces on their side but sometimes the world has changed i mean uh, uh, you have to 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 even if you don't like it uh, this is the compulsion of the time compulsion of the, the conditions uh, if we don't have uh, for the near future for the okay. middle level term these forces on our side it will go a big mess create a big mess uh, more than uh, for Afghanistan, for their neighbors. Okay, now let me ask you this, Mr. Rupert. Now the U.S. For, uh, the Trump administration has changed stance, as we mentioned. We've talked about this exhaustively before. And how does this look on the how how are the U.S. citizens receiving this change in stance after over a trillion dollars spent on this 17 year old war, and now the Trump administration is essentially endorsing the Taliban and uh, trying to negotiate with them. Know that uh, Americans are, are really not very interested in Afghanistan, um, and that's um, a big difference from the Vietnam War. Um, I mean, these two wars are often compared, but the Vietnam War there's a huge protest movement, um, partly inspired by the, they had the draft cons conscription in America back then, um, so many people were motivated to protest against the war, um, and now there's just uh, widespread indifference. I mean, Trump's base, however, um, obviously supported his anti-interventionist platform in the election. So there might be a, a sense that he needs to honor those, that pledge to stop um, fighting wars overseas. Well, it wasn't really a pledge he made, but he certainly uh, criticized interventionism. Um, so he might need to um, uh, uh, be consistent with that. Um, but I just think generally the American public just isn't very interested in Afghanistan, unfortunately. Hasn't you're saying that the Americans have not been uh, uh, criticizing the Trump administration who had campaigned to end this war to not having taken uh, any uh, of those measures that he had promised? Well, I don't think he campaigned to end the war, as I recall, but he was certainly cr very criti and unusually critical of foreign interventionism when he was a candidate. Um, actually, during the 2016 election, Afghanistan rarely came up. Um, and uh, I, I just I don't think his base would particularly care what happens in Afghanistan. Um, and uh, there's a general indifference among among the American public as, at large. 
Okay, and uh, Mr. Yasin, Mr. Yasin, let me ask you this. In terms of uh, the intra-Afghan dialogue and the possibility of it, one of those uh, uh, points that the U.S. is trying to push for in these peace talks that are taking place in UAE, how much hope is there for that? Well, if there is no hope, there is no means of uh, peace talks. There have always to be to uh, uh, this process. And uh, uh, both the sides, the uh, Taliban and also as well as the Afghan government, the mediation of the United States, Pakistan, UAE, uh, the Kingdom of uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, they have to push uh, for to set both the sides around the table. Uh, otherwise, it will be uh, meaningless uh, if it's go uh, around the West. But you don't the want fact that eat. the Afghan government has not been part of these peace talks or the ones earlier, doesn't that pose a problem? Well, that does cause a problem. I, I, that's what I'm trying to say, to explain, that at the end of the day, the Afghan government, political uh, entities, plus the, uh, to, to participate in this process and uh, talk to each other. And uh, there, there has to be a point that the, uh, sit together and resolve their problem with the help of our uh, uh, neighbors, uh, particularly uh, Pakistan, as I mentioned, UAE, Saudi Arabia, and on the top list, the United States, uh, to sit and, and, and reconcile. So inevitably, they have to sit there and talk to each other. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Yasin, for your input here on fire. And Rupert, now I'm coming to you as we come to a close to the program. What is the bigger challenge here? Is it the major regional powers coming in alignment on their uh, personal st uh, on their uh, strategies, or is it the dialogue among Afghan themselves? I think you'd, you'd have to say, to say the intra-Afghan dialogue is the most complicated issue here, the toughest, uh, the hardest nut to crack um, in the negotiations going forward. Um, but the the regional um, trying to harmonize the regional interest is very difficult too. I mean, especially given Trump's very tense relations with Iran and China. Um, I mean, these two countries are crucial to any um, settlement in Afghanistan. Um, and Trump uh, has, you know, trade problems with China and uh, he's withdrawn from the Iran nuclear deal. Um, and has a very belligerent attitude to Iran. And interestingly, Iran was omitted from um, Mr. Khalilzad's um, various travels. Um, and there's no solution to the war in Afghanistan without Iran's involvement. Yes, they're involved in the Moscow process, Kabul process. But I think um, uh, it is worrying that um, there seems to be a fissure emerging between this, these Gulf negotiations with Saudi and UAE um, and then Iran and Russia and everything on the other side. And I think we need the key thing to avoid in terms of these regional countries is parallel peace processes emerging, as happened in Syria, um, where you have one with um, dominated uh, by hosted by Russia on one side and then another um, format on the other with uh, Saudi and um, the others, Pakistan. So, um, yes, the regional issue is very complicated indeed. And both need to be carried forward together in parallel. Thank you so much, Rupert. Talking to us from Berlin, that's all from Newswire today. We'll see you tomorrow.